I'm delighted to be um, speaking with Dr. Will Davies, um, Chief Executive and Founder of PT, the Association for Psychological Therapies. Well, can I ask you first, how did you get into psychology in the first place? Oh, gosh. Um, well, when I got into psychology, psychology was hardly in existence. And um, uh, I went to UCL. They, they were and are, I think, one of the you know, most interesting places to study psychology at. But um, I was going to do engineering, actually. I was going to read engineering and did a, a last-minute swerve. Um, the school I went to was is all all boys' school, so you either did uh, well the various things you could do. You could do medicine, that was good. Um, you could do uh, maths and physics, pure sciences, or you could do applied sciences, which was engineering and so on. And that was pretty much it. There was uh, you could do English and languages, but that wasn't really quite the thing, you know. So so I did. Uh, I was going to do engineering. And one of the very good things that my parents did was to, they sent me along to the, what did they call it? They called it well, basically, is to judge your suitability for various uh, professions or jobs. And uh, they sent me along to this place. And they said, oh, you don't want to be doing engineering. You want to do something to do with people. And uh, I, there's lots of questionnaires and things, you know. And I was quite relieved when they said that. So I read the Ucca Handbook and... By the time I was getting to pee, I was getting a bit desperate. And psychology, that sounded good. And uh, so um, somebody said, well, the, you know, the best place to do psychology. And, and so, I, so I applied to various places. And UCL had the most uh, rigorous assessment procedure. And it made me think, gosh, if I get in here, then this is where I'm coming. It's a long answer to it. Sorry, Paul. No, that's good. <laughs> long answer to it. So after UCL, where, where to then, Will? Well, um, I, I was a bit disturbed during my time at UCL, so, uh, so I didn't do very well there. So, and it was, it was a pity because the, the head of psychology there, Professor Drew, so sort of took me under his wing a bit, really. And uh, what thanks did he get? Well, I got a, a poor degree and um, went and got a job, not, not, not that poor, but not, not the degree I'd have sort of hoped for. And, uh, and then went and got a job with Lloyds Bank, which took me about half an hour to realise I'd made a terrible mistake. And I went back to see uh, Professor Drew, who, you know, talked about non-judgmental. He was completely, uh, apparently delighted to see me. And uh, he said, I, I, I know, I've, I've, got, I've got a good friend, um, Amrick Straker, and he runs a prison psychology uh, service. So there and then he gets on the phone to his friend Amrick and uh, sort of makes out my case to, uh, to, to his friend Amrick. And it wasn't, uh, that didn't make it an open and shut case. You had to apply in the normal way and so on. But, uh, but yes, I ended up as a prison psychologist, uh, which was one of the best things I ever did. What, what did you learn there, Will? Well, I learned that there's all sorts of people in the world. Um, uh, bear in mind, I'd come from, you know, a, a fee-paying school, uh, UCL, uh, into, you know, Winston Green Prison and Hallfield Prison in Bristol. So I learned there's all sorts of people in the world. And, um, and I learned the importance of having uh, good colleagues both in terms of prison officers and uh, psychologists. Fantastic psychologists in the prison service. And you spent time at a regional secure unit as well? Yes, that was, uh, that was in the health service. That was, that was uh, 11 years in the prison service and uh, then moved into the health service and regional secure units were like a brand new thing then. So I had a clinical psychology, qu clinical psychology qualification by that time so it wasn't such a thing as a forensic psychology uh, format just, just then. That came a bit later. Um, so yes, yeah, I did. So um, you also worked at Sanders Northampton? For sure, yeah. And that came after the health service? Yes, yep. And that also was, well, frankly, that was a fantastic place to work because they, they took all comers, 
as long as you had really, really difficult behaviour uh, that the health service um, wanted to send on to an independent facility, we literally took all comers. And that was a great thing to do, to take everybody and to do your level best for them, what, what, whatever. And you also had the whole team working on the same side. Everybody was employed by St Andrews. Mm -hmm. Didn't matter whether doctors, psychologists, occupational therapists, nurses, social workers, they're all employed by the same, uh, the same organisation. And away you went. And that, frankly, was a phenomenal place to work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm. Yeah. So it meant that the, the someone was someone was everyone's boss. Yes. Good. Yes. Good. Yeah. Good. And you you felt like you're all on the same team. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Good. So where did APT, how did, or how did APT come out of all that? Well. Oh golly. Um, well, it started really uh, the seeds of it were in, when I was in the prison service, because. Um, there's very good training for, uh, for prison psychologists. And myself and Derek Perkins, or more rightly put, Derek Perkins and myself, were in charge of looking after the behavior modification training unit. And, um, uh, and that, and that uh, without wishing to be too uh, immodest, that was the best training unit. And it was, they were all rated, and consistently that came out as the best. So we worked out that we must have some sort of um, uh, ability in, in training. And uh, we, got, yeah, we got talking and thinking, well, wouldn't it be good to, uh, to, you know, to advertise these kind of courses more, more widely? So we did. We got uh, uh, an office facility in, uh, in Birmingham, a uh, person who would answer the phone and do typing and such like. And we sent out, uh, we sent out 2,000 uh, flyers to everybody local around Birmingham. We could think of, you know, probation, uh, health service, everybody, advertising half a dozen courses. And we sat back and waited for all these applicants to flood in. And we didn't get a single reply. Not a single reply. 2,000, there's a lot of flyers, we thought, to send out. And uh, not a single one. And I couldn't believe it. I thought, well, perhaps, perhaps they've not been sent. You know, perhaps they, they must still be in the postal system somewhere. And then, sort of slightly disappointingly, we, we got a reply. <laughs> so obviously they had been sent. Um, and but it was uh, thank goodness it was from the Birmingham Probation Service, and they wanted uh, a number of places on each of the six courses we got. And that was uh, that's what that's what started it. So um, uh, if it hadn't been for Birmingham Probation Service, uh, we'd just given it up as a bad job, I think. But uh, that's what started it. And we were running courses that you know, either Derek knew how to do it or I knew how to do it. And it, it's a long time ago, so it's difficult to really remember this. But in those days, you didn't have proper courses. You, know, you had somebody who kind of facilitated it. So you'd get sort of a dozen people together and uh, you, you share your knowledge. But nobody really knew whether it was knowledge or myth, really, on whatever subject it was. So, and, and somebody, the leader, would facilitate it, but he or she didn't know either, really. Uh, that was, I'm characterising it, but that was pretty much how it was in those days. And you had like third or fourth generation photocopies of something that somebody had found useful once. And it was very shoddy. So the idea of um, uh, having people who you know, confine themselves to talking about what they knew about and uh, actually had some expertise and uh, got good workbooks and so on to give to people. That was actually radical, so it very quickly caught on. Uh, so by, oh, after four, four years or so, it was, it was established. You know, by 1985, the Association for Psychological Therapies was established. You know? uh, yeah, and that's how it was. You've written many courses, well, o over the lifespan of, of, of APT to date. Which has been the most important? The, the actually is too boring, but the correct answer is we don't put out a course that we're not committed to. And we don't put out a course that's not useful either. And the one disappointing course for me was a course uh, about the the narrative you make of your life, narrative therapy. 
which to me is a really nice uh, approach. But it didn't prove to be useful enough. Because we, we evaluate how useful these things are, three-month follow-up and so on. And although the course went well, people went back. They didn't find it useful enough in real life. And you know, to my regret, we, 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 we dropped that course sim simply for that reason. So the first course that people found very useful was handling, um, handling aggression and violence, non-physical ways of responding to aggression and violence. And uh, a, lot, a lot of people found that terrific. And it was a big learning point to me too, because there wasn't a research on that subject at, at that time. What do you do if somebody's literally wanting to attack you and you're not going to defend yourself physically? It's all um, non-physical. And there wasn't, there wasn't, I had ideas and Derek had ideas and so on, but there wasn't a research on it. So what we did was we'd get people together and um, basically ask them, supposing this happens, so it's very tightly scripted scenarios, and they'd break into groups and produce their answers as to what you would do. Then, they'd, then we'd match it up with our prepared answers. So it was, uh, and then people found that very good because they related it to their own situation and what they would do if that kind of situation happened in their work. And as we got more expert at it and we heard everyone's answers, we were able to say, if this happens, then this is what you do. And interestingly, that, that didn't go down quite so well. People thrived on the, the actual business of working it out for themselves, if you know what I mean. So that was, that was a good, um, a good realization, a good, you know, good education for us, that even when you, ha when you really have got the researched answers, you don't necessarily just lay them on the plate and say that's what you do. You allow people to think of their situations, work it through for themselves, come up with their own conclusions and match that up with what other people have shown, you know. And of course that gives people a template to solve one problem that can be useful for others. Absolutely right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Was it difficult to transition well from being um, with Derek and yourself setting up the company, putting your energy and time into it, was it hard to get to a stage where you needed then to employ people to run the stuff that you were writing. Was that difficult? It, it was a little bit, but it wasn't even quite like that. Originally what happened was, uh, it was we ran courses on, on what Derek and I knew about. And then somebody uh, asked us to run a course on CBT. And neither Derek nor I thought we knew enough about CBT to run a course on it. But we knew somebody who did. So we said, well, we can't, but uh, Don, he could do a very good job on that. So they said, well, w would you ask Don uh, for us then? So we became almost like a broker at that point. Yes, we asked Don, and, uh, and Don used the office facilities, etc., etc. So um, Don didn't have the whole of the course fee. He had a proportion of it. So he was like a, we were like an agent for Don in that case. But it rapidly became that we had half a dozen Dons, and each one of them knew what they were talking about in their own area. But at that point, we, we weren't really writing the courses except for the ones that we were running. We handed it over to Don and Dave, etc., to run what, uh, what they knew about, you know. It was only at a later point where we sort of thought, well, no, we, we need to... Because it, it, people asked us for a lot of courses after a bit. And you know, Don couldn't run the CBT course every time because he had a full-time job. So maybe somebody else could run that. So, you know, it, Don, do you mind if you, you know, give us your course for somebody else to run it? Well, so it became that we were actually generating courses one way or another, and it became the name of the association that was allied to the course rather than Don or Dave or Will or Derek or whoever it was. So that was a big transition to be um, to you know to make it to make it so it was from APT rather than from Will, Derek, Don, or Dave. You know, so that was yes, that was that was interesting. And in in terms of moving from where you were initially, yourself and Derek, to where you are now, where you've over a hundred thousand people have done the courses. You have courses in every facet of of, of mental health, social care related areas, mm. uh, and you um, have uh, a number of uh, staff working for you, um, both here in Thornby and uh, through other tutors. 
Um, what's it been like to watch the, watch the EPT grow over those years? Wow, what a question. It's, um, I, I, like the, I like your implication that it's possible to sit back and watch it grow once you've planted it. Um, it's, uh, I mean, it's exciting. So you, what, what happens is you, 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 you uh, I mean, I, I joke that I work 24-7. But it's not much of a joke, to be honest. And, and I think, well, wh why do I do that? Because, you know, uh, time's gone on. And the reason is that uh, I like doing it. So, so the answer to your question is that um, uh, I, mean, it's, the, I think the growth has been contingent on uh, a lot of people doing a lot of very good work. I mean, the team in Thurnby, they are phenomenal. Every, talk about square pegs and square holes. Everybody admires the work that everybody else does because they know they couldn't do it as well. Uh, so everyone is doing a job that really suits them. And when we had the financial crash 10 years ago, the bottom went out of training completely. And all I knew was that uh, even though it's costing us a lot of money, we must keep the team together. Because teams like this do not, uh, they don't happen you know, accidentally or overnight, you know. And, uh, and, and so we did. And fortunately that financial crash was only perhaps for a year or two, a couple of years perhaps, where it really went, um, the bottom went out of it, and then it's climbed up again since. So the progression of watching has been zigzag, you know, and you're right that now we are uh, bigger than we've ever been in our 38 years, and you know, that's that is very gratifying. It's because we got pretty much 100 tutors, all of whom are doing their absolute best to do a good job. We do our best in turn be to give them good materials. So to see uh, to see the success is is gratifying is the is the word for it, you know. Good. And in terms of the um, the way the way that the company has progressed and moves on, uh, you mentioned your first few courses around um, managing aggression. Um, what are the what are the, the areas now, thirty eight years later, where are the big growth areas now? Well, what, what, what I like, to be honest, I, I like um, that kind of area. Uh, aggression, violence, uh, risk assessment and risk management. Uh, very difficult behaviours of when people are difficult to themselves and to other people. And, and therapies that, uh, that uh, are helpful in those areas. Things like DBT and the RAID course and uh, good diocese risk assessment and management. I, I love those kind of areas. Um, and yet, paradoxically, at the other end, um, and you'll excuse me talking about the ends like this, but at the other end, you're teaching people mindfulness is interesting, because I think mindfulness is actually really good. I think there's some, there's some very good uh, concepts in there. So we do sort of span, uh, of course, you know, purely on mindfulness through to what you do for people you can't do anything for. But in a sense, yeah, my heart is still at the end we started that, you know. But uh, yes, I can't remember what your question was now. But <laughs> if that answers so, so, it, well, I think you've answered it about how, how it's moved from how it's moved from migration and violence to many other things. But as yeah. you say, you're at, at heart, you're still that that that's, that area is probably where you go back to. Yeah. When we yeah. talk about we talk about um, your own uh, you, you, what, what's gratifying and what you enjoy. Do you have a hero psychologist or a particular psychologist either you've read or you've met over the years that's made a big impact on you? Lots, lots, lots. I uh, don't know whether it's helpful to mention names because as soon as you start mentioning names, uh, uh, the only thing that occurs to me is the ones I'm missing out. <laughs> and so, but yeah, let me, let me leave. There's, there's lots, to be honest. And I think the, the idea of people uh, working as models and examples for you are, are terrific. And the first one I, I came across was, was Professor Drew at UCL. And the idea that uh, having, uh, having performed so badly, really, in spite of his, well, in spite of his help, that he would get straight on the phone and, uh, and, and you know, go into bat for you. It was a very, very, very good thing. And it's just a very, um, sticks in your mind, really, doesn't it, you know? When people, unconditional positive regard, we call it now. But when you see good examples of it, it's, uh, it's very striking, you know.
And if if I was to wanted to help people and strive to be a good therapist and be someone who adds value to people's lives, and I asked you this awful question about, you know, I've only got money for three books. Which which three books should I buy? Oh wow! <laughs> apart from, apart from obviously doing the EPT courses, but which which three books should I buy? Will. Gosh. Well, I, I'm going to I'm going to dodge it. I'm afraid I'm going to dodge it because, but and I, I'm and I'm going to boast. I'm afraid, but just between you can cut this later. When my my daughter is a consultant psychiatrist, uh, one of my daughters, and she uh, she she um, when she was training, what was she? She had been a registrar, and her consultant said to her, she said, "There's only two books you need to buy." I can't remember which the other one was. But the one was overcoming anger and irritability, and uh, she couldn't believe it because she'd not read it. But uh, you know, she, she said, "That's my dad's book," and uh, as, as she came home and told me that. So, um, uh, but three books. Oh, I, t I, t I, t I will tell you one actually. Motivational interviewing. I'm not sure that it's got better o over the years. The 2012 is the latest version. Um, I like the first version, the 1992 version, when it very much linked up with the stages of change and so on. Um, but they're all good. It's uh, 1992, 2002, and 2012. It obviously takes 10 years to write a motivation interviewing book. And to my way of thinking, if you're, if you're going to have one book, that would be the one. Yeah. Yeah, I'll leave it at that, I think. Yeah. <laughs> What's your greatest achievement been? in all these years? Well, the trouble is, I, I, what I like is to do things that come natural to you. I think it's really important that you are in a situation that you're doing what comes natural to you. So on the one, on the one hand, I'm tempted to say, well, you know, to be doing this for uh, whatever number of years it is, you know, to stick at it and so on. But that wouldn't be right, because uh, I'm old enough to have packed up years ago now. And the only reason I don't is I don't want to pack up. So there's no credit in sticking at it. So in a sense, that's not, that's not an achievement. It's just what I like doing. So I suppose you could turn it around and say, well, to find myself a, a niche that I feel, I feel good in. And I think that be, I think if everyone does that, mm -hmm. that's almost like the best thing anyone can do for themselves. You know? Absolutely. So it's about doing what comes naturally and doing what you're good at. Over the next few years, where, where, do, where do you see life and work going for, for yourself, Will? Um, well, the the guy who ran Morrison's, uh, whose name was Mr. Morrison, he, uh, he he was a bit of a model to me because he worked up until he was seventy five, and and very successfully. And when he when he packed in, it's not that Morrison's got any better, but uh, and he worked very successfully up till seventy five, and um, a, a equally, there's an author I was reading the other day. Who is uh, uh, Hunter Davis, and uh, he's I think 85 now, and he says the most important thing to him is work. So, so where do you see things going? Along the same lines, I love the internet, and I think the uh, the internet and e-learning is fantastic because uh, it, it people can access everything, you know. And the ability to access our stuff, for example, our courses, people can sit in and, and do in the wilderness in Canada, uh, working away on one of our courses there. And I think that's, that's fantastic. And it uh, makes it much more accessible. It's cheaper, it's easier, it's, I wouldn't say it's better, but it is, it is pretty much as good as live training. And I think that's very exciting. But the, um, at the same time, I love live courses, and I mean, you know what it's like. You, you, you have an experience with people when you come back, and I read the feedback from what you've been doing. Just amazing. You, can't, you just can't beat it. But, uh, but at the same time, uh, distance learning is, is a phenomenon, I think. Mm -hmm. Any regrets or disappointments? Uh, well, there must be, wasn't there? It must, absolutely must be. Um, regression at this point. Uh, I'd love to think of a beauty, but uh, not, not that. Uh, 
be honest, I don't, I don't particularly like looking backwards. Mm. Only, at, only at nice things, you know, because I, I'm like you, I, I, I do believe that you can steer your brain. So, you know, steer what you think about. Why would you want to spend your time thinking about, you know, distressing things and so on? Uh, of which there obviously have been. You can't, can't live a life and not have distressing things. But, um, uh, but no, I don't, don't particularly like to think about that. I do love looking forwards, I must admit. It's uh, because, yeah, dream a dream and then work hard to achieve it. And that's, that's, the, that's what you do, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I know, Will, that's very important to you is your family. And um, one of the things I really enjoy about coming to, to Thornby um, is, to, is to meet the, the, your, your, your team who work here. But you have your two daughters work with you and your wife works with you as well. Um, how important has your family been? Oh, it's number one, isn't it? It is in a league of its own, isn't it? You know, yeah. Work is work is phenomenally important to me, but it, it doesn't doesn't get in the same league, does it? As as family. And does it feel sometimes you're the best of both worlds that you've got the work that you're so passionate about and enjoy and fulfilled by, and your family uh, essentially in in the doing in the same place in the same situation? Yes, for sure, because. Um, yeah, my, my daughter is uh, uh, an MBA, a Master's in Business Administration. She uh, she basically runs the runs the association. Um, my other daughter, consultant psychiatrist. So you know, it's it's lovely to see them uh, in, involved like that. Uh, likewise, Philippa, uh, my wife, she's uh, she's involved too. Yeah, you know? and uh, but that, and but to be fair. They're only part of the team here, yeah, and the other the other half is just as uh, just the same. You know, they're they're just amazing, and I often think, well, for them, it's it's difficult to be working with you know a, a family plus uh, it, it, uh, plus themselves, uh, but uh, they they do it, it's we feel like one team to me. I, I'm I'm sure they wouldn't contradict that. I'm, I'm sure they do. Feel like a team. It always feels like that. Certainly coming here, it always feels yeah. like a, everyone's a member of the family. And, and as someone as a as someone who only comes here sometimes, it always feels welcome and yeah. warm, and the kind of way for which we want it yeah. as well. But also uh, the yeah the, the broader team, the hundred hundred or so tutors. I like to think of them as a sort of um, in, in the same group because we are the association for psychological therapy. So it's an association of you know like-minded people in a way. All of whom are keen to to push you know to push what we push forward, you know. So that's always very much. I, you I hardly ever see them. You know, it's nice that you come over, but there's only a handful of people that actually come over. So, but nevertheless, as emails go flying everywhere, and it does feel like a, a, a another another nice team, you know. Mm. So, question we sometimes talk about is is a. The, the taxi driver scenario, what if someone like a taxi driver asks you a, a really direct question? And I've thought about this one, but for yourself, well, over uh, these years, which of the three best courses you've written? Three best ones I've written? <coughs> oh, the RAID course has to be, has to be. Because, I mean, that's a positive approach to working with very, very difficult behaviours. And when, when we first put that out, the amount of hostility and aggression uh, I, I'd be presenting it, so I saw it firsthand. People were just so angry that we would dream of having a positive approach to working with these kind of people, as it was said, you know. So that has to be number one. The DICE's course, uh, you know, in, in difficult work, you have, to do, you have to be able to do risk assessment and risk management. And that was a very nice team enterprise, actually. We got a good team of us together and, uh, and put together some very good materials which have evolved since then. So that's, that'll be um, the other. And, well, again, I'm, I think of the ones I'm missing out. And so I'll, I'll stop it there because I've, I'm beginning to feel now disloyal to some, some other <laughs> lovely, lovely cause. I often think, because there's some beautiful courses we've got on the, on the books, which people hardly ever buy, you know, and we've got huge sellers. But there's others which people hardly ever buy, and they're lovely, lovely courses. And I think sometimes I should actually put out a sort of list, half a dozen courses 
which no one ever buys. And why aren't you buying these things? Because <laughs> they're really good, you know. But the other, uh, but the, you know, big seller for us is DBT. Now I can't claim to have written that, of course, because it's uh, Marshall Linehan. But we've we've got our, our take on that, which um, does go down very very well. So, mm. so yeah. Mm. Tell us a little bit about Will Davies, the man away from psychology and EPT. <laughs> <laughs> what would you like to know? Anything. Um, no, it's, it's that's, a, that's a tricky one. Um, do you know, uh, years ago, I used to, uh, used to um, teach social skills training. And a huge thing, people, people would, wouldn't know what to say. They'd say, well, I find myself at a party and I don't know what to say. And I'd say, well, you can say whatever you like, you know. And that wasn't helpful uh, in, this, in the slightest way. It wasn't helpful at all. It was much more helpful to say, uh, um, you, know, you know, you must talk about something that was on television last night. Oh, okay. Uh, well, uh, Killing Eve, okay, let's talk about Killing Eve. And, uh, and that, that, that gave him, a, you know, to, to be constrained in some way was always very helpful. So, um, no, so I, I, can't, I can't build up my own constraints. Uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, you've, you've covered the two main bases, to be honest, family and work. Of course, there's cars. Uh, that's, uh, that's also there. But uh, no, you've covered you've covered the two main things really. You're you're a fan of a North London so football team as well. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I I'm I'm a fan of football, and I'm a fan and I'm a fan of Arsenal, but I do feel sorry for Arsene Wenger because I'm, I'm a fan of football managers to be honest, and uh, we've got a yeah, the, it, we've got the best football managers in the world easily in this country. And I think it's really good about people and managing people and bringing out the best in people. And you can't argue with it because there's a score every Saturday or every whichever day. So it's, it's very good feedback. <clears throat> and I look at uh, Arsene Wenger and he got Arsenal in the top four of the Premier League. He was there for 22 years and they're in the top four for 20 out of those 22 years. And, uh, and they got rid of him. I think, well, it's nice to think there's justice in the world, really, isn't, isn't, isn't it, you know? So, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I want to see his, I feel terrible mixed feelings about his successor, who is another very good man, so you want to see him doing well. On the other hand, you don't, because it's, it's kind of unfair to his predecessor. So, yeah, no, no, it's, it's a difficult area. <laughs> One of the things that people might know about you is that you had a, a hand in Ipswich winning the FA Cup in 1978. Well, I think the footballers had a good hand in that, actually, to be fair. That's, uh, they, were, they, they, did, they played their part. <laughs> no, ultimately, we're all responsible for what we do, aren't we? And, you know, to be fair, there was only, there was only footballers there. And um, they they did do extremely well, and uh, yeah, and Ipswich in those days was just the top thing, and Watford the same, yeah. And talk about good football managers, you know, Bobby Robson, a, a phenomenal manager, and uh, Graham Taylor likewise, you know. And again, he didn't get anything like the credit he deserved. He was a great guy and a great football manager. Great manager generally of people, and he got the, he got slated in the press uh, when he was the England manager, totally undeserved. I'd, I'd, uh, I was with him at Watford. I wasn't with him at uh, when he was at England. But I wish I had been in a way because, yeah, it's totally unfair what uh, what 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 how it happened there. I think. Mm -hmm. And the, at the time, the Ipswich piece especially was groundbreaking. That psychologists wouldn't have been associated yeah. with sport at that stage. Well, you're right. Yeah, myself and John Gardner, we were the first paid um, psychologists in football. Yes, you're quite right, yeah. And yeah, you're right, I'm proud of that. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Yeah. Good. So in terms of the, um, for myself, sorry, I've always felt like many people, I think, that, that haven't met you and got a chance to work with you. Certainly the raid and dice has changed my career, no question about that. And, the privilege of teaching the courses and getting the right one or two with you. So for me, it's this opportunity to say thanks publicly for that and for being a mentor and had the most um, influence in my career, without a shadow of a doubt. I know I'm not the only one. Yeah. But that said, is there anything 
I haven't asked you about so far that you'd like to mention. Well, just, just to respond to that, thank you very much. But the, um, we always, it's our little joke here in the association that there's only two things you have to do uh, to, to be successful in this area. One is to write really good courses and the other one is to find really good tutors. And it's our little joke because both of those are quite difficult things to do. Um, anything you not No, I feel as though you've asked me a, a lot, a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, and thanks for doing so. It's, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, answer these questions. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Will.